your microphone. Give me your name, spell your last name, and your title, or your, your former title when you were an active judge. Anytime you're ready. My name is Gerald Brown, and the title that I finished with at the court for over 20 years was the presiding justice of the Court of Appeal. First I was for the entire district, and then when the divisions were created, I became the presiding justice for Division I. Of District 4. Of District 4, indeed, Wonderful. yes. All right, Judge, my first question to you. Um, from your personal experience, what, uh, what is one of the significant cases or opinions that uh, had an impact on the citizens of the state? Well, uh, as I read it, it was on the judicial system. Yes. And I, I changed my case that I had in mind that was very helpful for all of the people of California, which I will mention later on. Sure. But now I want to mention something that uh, I figure was of significance to the judicial system. As time went on in my over 20 years on the Court of Appeal, I became more and more interested in writs. And we had had, in the first two years of my being on the court, a particular writ and that came to the court one day when I was here alone. I was the low man on the totem pole, and the normal thing when a writ came, it went to the presiding justice first, and then the next person in line, and I was last. But this one came to me because I was the only one here, and I had made a recommendation that it be, uh, that we take it under advisement and do something about it. And I wrote down four reasons why we ought to, and uh, then it awaited uh, for the other two judges to return, and the presiding justice came to me and said that uh, the, we too, uh, Judge Coffin and I, think that uh, the writ should be denied, and would you like to change your your thought. And I said very uh, gently to him that, well, leave it as it is, uh, and we'll see what, uh, w what happens. And um, the Supreme Court took it over, and in due time granted the writ. It involved a hospital, and it wanted to sell bonds, and dates had been set. And then I saw the lawyer long after jurisdiction was over, and uh, so I could speak to him about it, and I, uh, who had brought the writ, and uh, said how pleased he must be, and he said uh, uh, it was a hollow victory because time had elapsed on all of the things that, that uh, were re required, and it just made me feel bad for some years to think that here we were, the judicial system wasn't able to respond. And later on then, in, and it was in the latter 70s, I having come to the court in uh, 1963, in the latter 70s I developed a system uh, where instead of granting an alternative writ, we would ask the attorneys to just forget the word alternative and concentrate on peremptory, ask for a peremptory writ and give all of the uh, necessary notices so uh, people could appear and no one would be deprived of uh, making an appearance in the case and letting us know what their views were and then we could handle the, the case and get it done with dispatch rather, having, rather than having to send out notice and hold a hearing in court and then the court take it under advisement and have 90 days <laughs> or 60 days, whatever, to file a no opinion on it. Get it out with dispatch. And the case of... of uh, 
nuclear, uh, United Nuclear Corporation versus the Superior Court, and it happens to be on, on the other side, the, the respondent was the General Atomic Company. In that case, the petition was presented to the court on December the 8th, requesting a peremptory writ, and then on the December 16th, just eight days later, we wrote the opinion. So there it was handled with dispatch. And although it doesn't say so in the opinion, it's a, it's a very short opinion, there was uh, a third of a billion dollars at stake in the case. And I am told by the clerk of the court now that people were coming by the court in droves to get copies of this opinion and continued to do so for some time. And it is in 113 Calap the third at page 359. So it was with great satisfaction to me that we finally were able to devise a system where writs could be handled with, with the dispatch and uh, you would not have the situation of justice delayed is justice denied. Thank you. In your view, what, uh, what is the, the benefit of the Courts of Appeal to the people of California? Without the Courts of Appeal in, in the state of California, the judicial system would be a disaster. Uh, in 1965, where I, when I had become the presiding justice, I had lunch with Lewis Burke, who had been a presiding justice on the Court of Appeal in one of the divisions in Los Angeles, and he was now on the Supreme Court. And we were in, uh, in Sacramento, having lunch together with Gordon Files, And he said, the Supreme Court takes over about 4% of the cases on appeal. The, oh, the balance of them, 96% are handled by the courts of appeal. And the Supreme Court has seven people on it, they have been able to expand their work. And at that time, uh, each of the justices on the court had four research attorneys. The presiding justice had more because uh, he or she, had, and at that time it was he, um, in 1965, that, that would have been Trainer, um, had central staff. And, and more more people to assist in getting the work out. And uh, uh, no additional court members have been made to the Supreme Court, nor have they in the United States Supreme Court been more than the nine. Uh, but there have been additional people uh, put on the courts of appeal. I think maybe today there's something in 120 to 130 judges on the courts of appeal. And I remember in the latter uh, 70s, there were 79. And I remember it for one particular reason. Um, one time meeting with the Chief Justice Rose Elizabeth Byrd, um, the presiding justices uh, of the courts, and possibly others as uh, the uh, associate justices as well. I remember it was a fairly large meeting, and she said uh, the legislature, which has been very, which has had to be very stingy in contributions to all the parts of government, uh, uh, had allowed for eight and more research attorneys for the Courts of Appeal. And back in about 1959, the Courts of Appeal got their first 
research attorneys for each judge. Up until that time, the judges had to do all of the work themselves. And uh, uh, here was a chance to get eight more to be distributed amongst 79 judges on the Courts of Appeal. And she, uh, she said all of those who are interested uh, in having some of these judges uh, write me a letter and say so. Uh, I knew at that particular time her mind had been made up and she had decided to give four of them to a division in the first district in San Francisco and four to the second division. And that continued for two years. They, they had uh, the four. We had five judges in this division uh, who were um, uh, uh, sitting on our court. And one time in, in uh, I think it was in July, it was either 79 or 80, uh, the Chief Justice called and she said, I am sending you five of the eight research attorneys starting in, and you can start in uh, September. And so uh, uh, as soon as I hung up from uh, that particular uh, uh, call, I went in right away to see Judge Cologne and then see the other judge, just judges on the court to tell them about this big news, this good news. And uh, so we worked it out there and figured we could maybe do 15 more cases a month uh, there with having the assistance of these five people. Uh, and uh, uh, they might even do better th than that. And then the following March, we got a call from Bert Oliver, who was the financial man under Ralph Gampel, the administrative director of the courts of the, of the, of the courts in, in San Francisco. And he, he said, would you and Judge Cologne come to the legislature and make a presentation here? We want to get more, some more judges and see if you can get 15 more. And uh, so we went up there, and it was before a Senate committee, and the very distinguished uh, senator of long standing from Torrance was in, in charge, and um, we made our presentation. And we had done our, the 15 a, a month. We didn't need a note before us to, to follow. Uh, both of us, both the, uh, both Judge Cologne and I were fully familiar with all of the facts, and we told them. And it was very good to have uh, a one of the one of our judges uh, there, a former senator uh, there in the legislature. Everyone just uh, were delighted to see him. And when we got through uh, with that meeting, we got the fifteen. And we felt very happy about that. And, and uh, I don't, this, this is something you can delete, but, but I will, will say it. The, the senator's uh, very, uh, very fine, long established staff of one person named Florence said to me as we walked out together after leave, all of us walked out and we all went out the same door. And she said to, to me, uh, and she was speaking to, for both Judge Cologne and me, she said, that was the finest presentation I have ever heard made to a committee here in the legislature. And uh, so we were happy with, uh, with, with the result. And we continued on. We were given the, uh, the five judges for the following year. And then suddenly comes March, and we hear from Bert Oliver, will you and Judge Cologne come up to the legislature and make a presentation here again? And this time it is the, the Assembly's Judicial Committee with Maxine Waters, who is the chairperson. And uh, we, our, our plane is late. 
when we get there to the legislature, as we walk in the door of the room, our matter was called. We didn't get to either sit down or to hardly have a word with, with Ralph Gampel or um, Bert Oliver. And they'd, they said, see if you can get it up to from, from the 22, the 8 plus 15. Uh, see if you can get up to about 40. And I said, we're going for the whole ball of wax. And we went on up, and the two of us made our presentations. And there were 79 judges on the courts, courts of appeal. And they increased the number when, as we stood there to 79. Probably the greatest satisfaction that I ever felt while a judge on the Court of Appeal to think that we had been able to get uh, the, the whole thing. And we had the statistics th there because all of, our, all of our judges were hard workers and getting the work out and, and uh, uh, su supervision over the second uh, research attorney and it all fitted in well. So there, there's the history of that. I probably had a very unique situation. I never applied to be a judge, and when I became a judge, I never applied to be the presiding justice. Uh, but I was a friend of the governor, and I remember Judge Griffin used to say, uh, he was, when I first came, the presiding ju justice of the Court of Appeal. Uh, he said, a judge is a person who knows the governor. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Governor Pat Brown, had, uh, I had had a con conversation with him in November 1962, and he said, I, at the end, he says, I, I invite you to come to my inauguration. And I thanked him for that, but I never really thought I would go. And, and when I mentioned it uh, to the firm I was with in Riverside, Best, Best, and Krieger, they said, you are going. <laughs> you, you go. He said, not everyone gets an invitation from the governor. But later on in the, month, the, in the month of December, I got a call from someone who was, a, who was close to the governor. And he said, uh, Judge Shepard uh, has been forced to retire. He has made the decision to retire because of health, and he is retiring. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he said, um, I mentioned to the governor your name. And he said uh, his face looked electrified. And he said, remind me to call Gerald Brown in about 10 days. And uh, then on the 5th of January, I was down working at the office on a Saturday morning, two days before the inaugural, and uh, the, uh, I took a call from the governor. And uh, he said, what are you doing at work? What's the idea <laughs> on Saturday morning? And uh, just a very pleasant way to, to start. And he asked if I was interested. And I told him that I was. Uh, and I didn't want to say to him, well, I'd like to consider it or anything like that. But I had not had much time to think about it. But I thought I was then 47 years of age. I had been a trial lawyer for a long time. Uh, in my practice. I had um, gone through the tensions and the nervous energy that it takes to be a trial lawyer, and I had with older lawyers who were, say, in their uh, latter 30s, uh, er, uh, uh, I had heard them say, well, uh, when I get to be 45, I think I will have had enough of trial work. And uh, not everyone can be a, a Joe Ball, who was a trial lawyer to the end of his life. Um, but um, 
so it, it seemed to me uh, then at, at, at 47 this would be a, a good time to, to leave and uh, uh, the governor considered the fact that I had was a trial lawyer. Uh, I knew what the superior courts were like and, and this was uh, an opportunity when he could put someone just directly from the practice uh, who knew the background of lawyers more recently than having, say, been on the superior court and would, would uh, uh, consider, amongst other things, uh, the lawyer's view uh, more. Why, at least uh, th that was one of the things that he mentioned. But he said at the end of the conversation that, uh, well, don't sell your law books yet or don't close the office yet because there were other things that needed to be done. But he said, uh, you're coming to the, to the, my inaugural on Monday, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, well, come in and see me. <laughs> and so I did that. And uh, uh, the, the morning <laughs> of his inauguration, and we had a visit for a half an hour. And, and then he had to do something. He says, come back <laughs> and, in, uh, in uh, 45 minutes or so, and we'll, we'll talk more. But even then, they, they, uh, uh, he did a lot. He did all of his own research. People were ca called that I talked to, or who call, called me and uh, said, uh, there on that very Saturday in the afternoon, uh, he had called several people to inquire about me. And so he, he, he worked hard on that. Uh, on that and, but imagine. Uh, that was on the 5th of, of January, and when you think of the long time that it takes now before the ball has started to roll and the appointment is made, he called and made the appointment on January the 21st. So that was just uh, 16 days, I think, something like that, two days more than two weeks. Uh, and that was enough for me, by the way. <laughs> and. And uh, so I didn't really have to go through it too much, except I was kind of glad to switch. And um, I, uh, I, I want this to be taken in, in the proper way. The work here was an awful lot easier than it was to practice law, because it seems to me like I was all the time working on 14-hour days. And here it would be, uh, wouldn't have to do that. Just briefly, um, because I've, I've got a, another appointment next. My yes. question is uh, a personal anecdote. And, and again, I'm looking for a, a fairly brief summation of, of just a, a recollection you have from your years on the bench of something that stood out of you, significant, or maybe it was humorous, or, or a personality thing, what, what have you. I, I, uh, yes. Um, thanks to the suggestion of some friends that Olive and I had, before we came here from our, from living in Riverside, we knew uh, a couple here, George and Mary Jessup, in our church. And the Jessups were well known in the jewelry shop field here. They suggested uh, one time when I had been coming down to work from Riverside each week, um, until school, I, starting in March, uh, I first came to work. I think March the Mar about March the fourth of 1963. The uh, the Jessup suggested in May that we live in their home in the Presidio area for the weekend when they when they went to their cabin in Julian, and uh, uh, when they came home Sunday night and. Ollie was about to drive home to Riverside with the children. Uh, Mary spoke about how wonderful it was to live in the hub of the city rather than out in the suburbs and have to drive in. And this was the hub. And that, that impressed us tremendously. And we liked the Presidio area. And we settled in, um, in Mission Hills. And 
rented for two years. And I no sooner started driving to work on Fort Stockton Avenue, and I noticed very soon uh, a man come out the front door of his home, uh, George Koblen, the clerk of the court. So I stopped, and he always went by bus down to the court. And it was three miles, uh, and I picked him up uh, there in, in March uh, 1963, uh, uh, no, starting in July when we, we had moved, the family had moved in. And um, uh, George um, uh, retired in 1968, so five years later, it was almost every day I took him back and forth. We had a lot of time to to tell stories and so forth. And he told me how it was in the days when the court was a circuit court and they, uh, the Court of Appeal, which had started in 1929, uh, they met for the summer months, May, June, July, and August in June in uh, San Diego. Uh, in San Bernardino, they started in September, October, November, December. And then in Fresno, uh, January, February, March, and, and April. And it was their policy of getting all of the opinions written before they left. And say the, the, you were in your fourth month and you had you were just about to finish your time in a certain, uh, in one of the, in either Fresno or San Bernardino or San Diego. Uh, they would be sure to get their work finished. He said, we were in Fresno one time and had gotten all of the cases filed. And then that afternoon, we went out to play uh, golf. And I was probably, Judge Marks uh, was there uh, with us, and Judge uh, Barnard, who was the presiding justice. And he said, uh, uh, someone came rushing out on the golf course and said that Judge Marks had an urgent call. And he grumbled a little bit and left, and they waited for him, and finally he he came back and he, he said, well, it was a lawyer, and he said he uh, wanted to know what the result was in such and such a case that had been filed. And, and Judge Marks said, told him, um, well, read the opinion, read the opinion. And the, the lawyer's reply to him was, I did read the opinion, <laughs> and I'm still searching to find the result. And, of course, that uh, dis displeased uh, Judge Marks even more. But that was uh, one, one of the stories that, that uh, uh, George Koblen told me about. Then he said, our court was founded there at the time of the Depression, 1929. The Fourth District started to do business. And he said, when Judge... Barnard became the presiding justice. He was just always so careful with, uh, on, the, on the telephone calls that he would make long distance. And in those days, the, as, as I can so easily re remember, when you, when you called long distance, you got three minutes. You paid for three minutes, no matter uh, wh whether you needed it all. And uh, I can recall once when I was going to law school in New Haven, I, at Christmas time, I called home to my family, and I told the operator, now interrupt me at the end of the three minutes, because I didn't want to, I felt I couldn't afford and ought not to spend more than three mis minutes to get my message of what I had in mind to do in coming home to see everyone. And so um, Judge uh, George Koblen said, um, if Judge Barnard couldn't get uh, his business 
concluded in the three minutes and still didn't have the answer. Nevertheless, he hung up. That was it. He was so careful um, uh, in, in seeing to it that nothing more was spent than, than that. Now, I think probably I've used up enough, enough time. I have other things to, to say, but uh, I, uh, I would mention when you asked uh, about a personal, uh, about a case which, uh, which may have helped very much uh, uh, on the, um, the, the people of California. Uh, at the end of my first year, I filed the case of Tischauser versus the, um, versus the city of Newport Beach. And it, yes, all that. I'm just okay. going to give you the citation. Great. And uh, that is uh, 225 Calab II at page 138, where we saved the lands along in, at the sea for the people of California when, when a landowner, nine landowners, wanted to take that land all for themselves in, in, on the island of Balboa in, uh, in Newport Beach. And I believe that, that case uh, was of great assistance so that all along the state, uh, at, the, at the sea, they, there are places that are, are remained open so that the public can have access. All right. Great. I wonder, I always wondered where the coastal access yes. law 